Okay, so <clears throat> GPU memory. When we, we re, when we look at this kernel, we have, we're passing in two, three, three float arrays, which are basically regions in memory. And if this were in the CPU, those regions would just be in RAM, and we'd read from them. But on the GPU, it's a little bit more complicated. So the GPU has a main memory. Um, I think I have a picture. And it's basically the exact same thing as RAM. And here it is. It's big. On the biggest GPUs, I think we get six gigs. It's not a lot, but that's what it is. Um, so when we read, we, we do these, these instructions, um, reading from AI and BI, we're going down here to this memory to read that stuff in. So before you launch a kernel, you have to copy your data to the GPU. It goes across the PCI Express bus, and it's slow. And that's one of the main drawbacks of using GPUs, is, is if you have to do this a lot, you're, you're going to see really poor performance. But we have several regions of memory um, that we need to talk about, because they have very different performance and implications and usages than what we, they do on the CPU. I think, from my perspective, dealing with the memory is the biggest difference in the programming paradigm. It's, it's a lot more, requires a lot more knowledge to get it right. Um, there's a lot of restrictions, and I think this is one of the main reasons that GPU programming hasn't taken off as much as it should have, or it could have, because this part is hard. So, the way that um, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So we have these different regions. Now, they're not in any real order here, um, just more in the, the typical usage. We have registers, and they're the same, kind of the same as you get registers on a CPU. We have global memory, which I talked about a little bit. We have shared memory, which is um, basically an L1 cache or an L2 cache. Um, we have local memory, which is the most poorly named memory region you've ever heard of. And then we have texture and constant memory, which I'll talk about a little bit. So in the picture, at the very top are where the processing happens. So if you're doing your math, you're doing all your number crunching, it's happening at the very top. So if you need to read from memory, you have to go all the way down to here to get it. And there's, there's kind of order of magnitude access time for each one of these. So it's, it's 100 times it's about 600 times slower to go to main memory than it is to registers. And that is terrible. It's just awful. Um, so we have these other hierarchical structures that help mitigate that. You'll notice that registers are basically old. Well, they're the same as on a CPU. It's in the CPU. It's ready to go. We, have, we pay no cost to read that stuff or write it. Um, but that's not entirely true because there are there are, um, and you don't have to ever worry about this when you're programming, but read after write, and, and I don't know if you've taken programming languages or operating systems, so we have these um, dependencies that compilers figure out for us. Well, that happens in a GPU too, and they incur some number of cycle costs, and I won't really talk about that, but it's basically free. Um, so registers are good. Shared memory is a user-managed L1 cache. So you decide what you want to put in the L1 cache, and you read from there. That, that, that's definitely different than standard CPU stuff, because usually you just read it in, and the most frequently accessed things stay in cache. But on a GPU, one, one access out of a thousand that's in global memory just totally kills all performance. So you have to be pretty specific about where you put stuff. Um, Let's see what else we have. We have a uh, constant cache. A constant cache is a very small area of memory that's used for constant variables. It's, it's basically just something you can't write to, so if you have lots of scientific constants, you can kind of put them in there. Um, or if you're, yeah. There's also a texture cache. Um, GPUs are all graphics based, so everything in, in a GPU is somehow related to a texture. Um, textures are, are have very specific graphics kind of and, uh, design, and the same texture cache and the same texture units that you used in CUDA are what gets used when you do DirectX and, and various graphics things. So uh, 
those have a cache, but that's a spatially located cache. Textures you typically like kind of a picture. So if you read one area, it gets the stuff around it. It's a spatially located cache. Um, and it's got interesting properties too. I won't talk too much about that. It's not widely used in CUDA. And then you see this local memory thing. Um, typically in when you write code and you have a function or some procedure, whatever you want to call it, you initialize some local variable. That's local memory and it goes on the stack. In CUDA, if your thing, if your your variables in your register or your variables or your data structures are in local memory, it means they're actually way out here in global memory because they can't fit in the register file. So the register file, where all the registers are, is shared with the shared memory cache. And if that's too big, stuff spills. And there's there's that typically this doesn't happen on the CPU because these caches are huge on the CPU, giga, megabytes of caches. We have like 64K, so it's pretty small. And when we overflow that, we spill stuff. And the only other place it can go is way down the bottom of local, local memory. So local memory is bad. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about each one of these. Um, so we went over global. It's basically the same as RAM. It's far away from the cores. It takes a long time to get data there. Um, and there's one other restriction that when you access it, you have to access it in a very special way to get the maximum performance. Okay, and we'll definitely talk about more about that. I think I'm going to the next slide. Also, to get data to the GPU, when you do the copies from the CPU from the host, that's where all the memory ends up. And if you want to copy results back, it has to be already put in the global memory. So if you do a bunch of stuff in your local caches, you still ultimately have to dump it to global memory before you copy it back to the CPU. So, what is a regular access? This is regular access. Now, think about these arrows as individual threads, and they're accessing some addresses in global memory. So, you have 128 bytes of global memory broken up into 32-byte um, chunks, I think. So these are all, all your threads in a, in a warp. And they want to read some data from memory. This picture says that each thread, thread 0, is reading something on a 0, a 128 byte boundary. And every other thread is reading the next contiguous 4 bytes or 8 bytes. So you, you're, you're grabbing a chunk of data that's all contiguous that all starts on 128 byte boundary. This is what you want in almost all cases. Because even though we have 32 threads making 32 different requests, on the latest GPUs it actually ends up only being one request of memory. So the memory subsystem says, oh that's cool, I'm just going to grab all this chunk, this chunk of data and disseminate it how you're asking for it. Um, these these charts down here are the, the different versions of the, the graphics cards. Some of them are more capable than others, uh, as you can see. So for instance, the maximum size request on older cards is uh, 64 bytes, but on the newer ones, it's a full 128 bytes. So this is what we're going for. We want each thread to be accessing one thing, the next thread to be getting the, the thing in memory after it, et cetera, et cetera. So when we do that, what happens is all those memory requests get what's called coalesced into a single request, and we only have to pay one price, one trip to global memory for 32 values. So that, that's how we get the high memory bandwidth, the 250 gigabytes a second memory bandwidth is when we do this. So typical programs and algorithms don't have this kind of structure, so we have to typically change the algorithm to make it into this kind of access pattern. Because once we change stuff, now look what we get. So on the older cards, we have one or two um, non-sequential accesses for whatever reason. That goes from two requests to 32, serializes every single one of those requests that every single one of those threads made into 32 different requests. Now we have 32 times 600 cycles instead of one times 600. So it's a huge penalty. It's absolutely critical that you don't do this. Um, it's a little bit better on some of the newer cards, but even 
but a lot of um, a lot of applications and stuff still do things this way. And you, even on the newer cards, if you know that this is happening, but it happens across a byte boundary, you, you're going to pay a higher penalty here. So it, it's just very good form to do things in, in a line sequential way. And then there's the, the really bad example is when it's misaligned and and sequential. So this is actually this could be worse um, if these were swapped. But now look, we have just a huge a huge amount of of replay. They're called replays when you have to send the, the request again. So we have no coalescence. We're, every time we go to memory and this happens, we're gonna we're just gonna wait forever. So. Um, <clears throat> This is kind of the the, um, the bottleneck and why this stuff is hard, just because of this reason right here. Uh, the, the later versions, the newest stuff, has realized that this is a problem and it has made it better. Um, but when you have lots of threads, you notice this is this two of them instead of instead of one. So you, if you do it right, you you know that's 600 extra cycles per warp, and you might have 100,000 warps. So it still makes a pretty big difference. So when you're, when you're going to memory, you need to be what's called coalesced. And how do you know that that's happening? Well, um, I, didn't, I don't have any slides on it, but NVIDIA provides something called the, the Visual Profiler. And you run your code, and it's basically like running it in um, GProf, and it counts all the number of accesses that you made that are misaligned, that are uncoalesced, and you can see the later versions actually um, are built on top of <coughs> Eclipse, which bugs me. But um, if you set up your project right, it can actually tell you what lines of code are causing the uncoalesced accesses. So that's kind of neat um, because these these issues, you know, you can go from you have some, some application written in C, and you port it to the GPU, and you get 20x speed up. And you're like, cool. And then you run it through the NVIDIA visual profile, and you see you have these, these messed up coalescences, and you fix them, and now you're at 120x speed up, just by the memory accuracy. So it, it really makes a big difference. So let's see. Registers are registers, the same as in the CPU. The only difference is we have significantly less of them. So there are certain scientific applications and kernels that are doing all sorts of crazy math um, that blow the registers and they spill into local memory and that kills performance. For example, the implementations of sine and cosine functions typically use a pretty long series expansion and they, that just doing that, every thread uses 40 registers just for that series expansion. And if you have 256 threads, 40 times that, you're already, you don't have enough space. You know, so there's, there's, it, it is an issue, and you do have to worry about it. Um, Nvidia provides, and I think yeah, OpenCL might too, um, various libraries that use less threads and less have less accurate. Uh, sorry, less registers, but have less accuracy. So if it's that big of an issue, um, registers are per thread. Registers are per thread, but. Back to way back to this picture. All the cores share the register file, so all the cores have the same amount of registers. Um, <clears throat> sorry, all the cores require the same amount of registers, but the space needed comes from a shared pool. Okay. And that shared pool is shared with the shared memory. So I think we'll talk about next. But yes, every thread has its own local kind of registers. But there's a max number of registers that get yeah. divvied up amongst everything. Yep. So. so if you require a lot of registers, what that does is it changes how many thread blocks can be active at a time, which yeah. decreases performance. So you want as many thread blocks on the G GPU as possible. So what happens when you make a memory request and the GPU says, oh, I want to I want to toss another thread block on there. You need to have more thread blocks on there. And to have more thread blocks on there, you need to have space and registers are in. But if you're using fewer cores, you get more registers per core. Yes. Okay. Um, so if right you're on. using fewer cores, or if each core is doing more work, you don't. You need. So this is kind of the the black art of balancing this sort of thing. 
and it depends on the application, it depends on what specifically you're doing, if you're memory bound, if you're CPU bound, uh, GPU bound, that sort of thing definitely makes a difference on how to decide what to maximize. And these, these questions and this sort of uh, discussion is more of a, uh, it's a little bit more advanced. Like you wouldn't worry about this until after you've done your implementation and you say, oh yeah, it's fast, it works, now let's make it really fast. Because that's kind of the flow, you do it, you get a 5 or a 10x speed up, and then you really do it, and you get a 20 or 30x speed up. It's typically how, how these things work, because it's so hard to get this stuff right the first time. Uh, so I think the next thing, let's see, shared memory. So we're going to talk about shared memory. Yeah, we are. OK. So basically, I said shared memory is a user-managed cache. So I said going to global memory is very expensive. But think about an image or a matrix where you're doing operations on a collection of neighbors. And if every thread, so um, you know, if, if, you, if you grid, create this grid here, and this thread needs to do, do an operation on itself and use the data from all its neighbors, so it needs those nine boxes. But every thread is doing the same exact thing. So now this thread needs the information from itself and those boxes. So all of these boxes here are shared by these two threads. So you don't want to have to read them twice. You can put them in this user managed cache and then they're there basically in registers so you don't have to reread them from global memory every time. That's what, what shared memory is. Um, so this is really an image because you're processing that you'd want that entire image in the shared cache. Um, so so maybe the outer edges. It depends on um, on what you're doing to the image. So like in um, a convolution, right? Uh, typically a convolution, you have, this is a good example, you usually, um, you know, a convolution for this, this value is gonna use it, these nine neighbors and only those nine neighbors. So you, this value does not, the convolution value, the resulting value for this thing doesn't care about anything over there. So you don't need the whole, the whole image. For, for whatever thread block is doing okay. this process. So the shared memory is per thread? The, the shared memory is actually well? uh, on the block level. Okay. So all the threads in a block can share information, but not threads across blocks. So you'd want whatever portion of the image was being used by more than one thread in the block yes. you would put into there. Exactly right. So um, matrix multiplication is kind of the canonical example here. Um, and, and this is actually a relatively difficult thing to implement. Uh, there's a lot, a lot going on. But if you remember matrix multiplication, um, you have, uh, draw it out here, just because I have to do this when I do matrix multiplication. Um, you know, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's, that's your matrix. You want to multiply it by another matrix, A, B, C, D, E, F, C, G, I, you're going to get another 3 by 3 matrix, right? So the middle value here is the product of this column and that column. And the, um, this value here is the product of this, this row and this column, right? So to get this value, you need to read all these things in. To get this value, you also need to read all those things in. So you don't want to have to read them in twice. So you can put this tile basically in shared memory. So when you when you get any one of these, you do any one of those processors, you've already got the data for it in shared memory. And this is the typical uses of shared memory. Kind of a canonical example. So um, in the picture here, you see that this element that we're computing in the answer requires all of that stuff and all of that stuff. This one here that would be next to it still requires all of this stuff, so you don't want to you don't want to have to go and get that again. Um, this becomes very complicated when your matrix is big, because shared memory is small. So you have to kind of do this in chunks, and I won't go into it, but the the CUDA comes with an implementation of this, and it's it's pretty interesting how you how you can tile. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. So that, that's what shared memory is, and 
in the earlier versions of CUDA, it was absolutely required that you use it because there was no caching on global memory at all. So you needed to do this. The newer versions have a level uh, two and a level three cache that are, in my experience, somewhat, they work a little bit unexpectedly. You can still use shared memory, and people do. Um, it's suggested that you do, but it's, uh, in, uh, NVIDIA introduced the, cache, the caching to kind of get the application programmer to be able to write your application, so they wouldn't need to worry about caches, and it would just do this stuff for you to make it easier, though it makes analysis real, really difficult. Um, so I would still recommend explicitly using shared memory, and most people still do. The other, um, the other thing about shared memory is it goes in the same space on the chip as the registers. It's kind of, it basically you're just allocating more space to use as registers. So if you have a high register usage kernel, you can't use a lot of shared memory and vice versa. Um, you can tell the kernels at runtime how big to allocate for each of these things. So if you know you're not going to use any shared memory, just you don't have a, a, that kind of application, you can allocate all of that space to registers. You can, you can split it up in, in different ways. So that, that's, that helps, um, but it's still very limited. Let's see. So local memory. I think we, I mentioned local memory. It's what happens, it's really when stuff doesn't fit in your registers, it goes to local, and that's called register spillage. And when you, when you compile your code, the NVIDIA compiler will tell you when this happens. And if this happens, and you're not using shared memory, maybe you can increment the size of the registers, and maybe it will go away and you'll get considerably better performance. So there's, there's these things to worry about as well. Um, there's a constant memory um, region I mentioned, and the interesting thing about constant memory is, you know, we talked about, um, we talked about these accesses, how they have to be all contiguous and, and aligned and sequential and all that stuff. Constant memory is the exact opposite. It's high performance when everything accesses the same value. So, um, at, you know, every thread is reading the value of pi, or every thread is reading Planck's constant, or whatever it is. If you have one thread reading one value and one thread reading another value in shared memory at the same time, those accesses get serialized. So it's kind of the reverse. But constant memory is um, small and typically not used too much. It doesn't. It's not a huge performance uh, issue. Do you have to set it up manually, or does the compiler populate it based off constants it finds in your code? You have to set it up manually. At least you did in the last version of all okay. the tools. So, Unless they um, just added it. It's um, it, it does make a difference. Like it goes in a different space. So if you, typically you, you would those things would go in registers. You can just stick them in constant memory if they're not going to change, and then you free up register space. So there's there's other benefits to it as well. But this is the type of thing like you kind of got to know, and these are the types of issues that are the reason that adoption for this technology isn't through the roof. I think because this stuff is difficult and hard, and it takes a while to get. Um, and you know, like you write your code, and you're like, yeah, Nvidia said I get 100x, and it's four. It's because of these sorts of things. So I mentioned texture memory. Texture memory is the same texture units that the graphics cards, or the graphics games use. Um, the interesting thing about that is they have this spatially located cache, which can be pretty cool. Um, but you can't write back to texture memory. You can write to it, but then it evaluates the cache, and any reads that you do after that are not coherent. So you you kind of have to you have to know that, um, and, and you can still use it, but it's. That you, you need to know that when you write stuff back, you've invalidated your cache, so you, anything else you read may or may not have the right values. Um, the other cool thing that it does is there are certain hardware units attached to texture memory where when you read stuff out of it, it automatically does operations on it. So if you want to do, the classic example is interpolation. You want to, you have these values in your texture and you want a value at some other place. It will do the interpolation for you in hardware when you read it up. So you don't have to write code for that. You don't have to. It comes for free, totally. There's no cost there. And if you're doing that sort of thing, texture memory can definitely help. I don't find it. People use it too often for scientific purposes. Um, 
it was pretty big. It was really the only way to do stuff before CUDA happened, and that's people just used the texture caches. So that's what they did. Um, so here's, here's the other issue with memory. I mentioned this a little bit. So it takes a long time to go, go to global memory. If you have a block of threads, 256 threads, each, uh, and then every warp has 32 threads, so that's what, um, eight, eight warps, maybe? Um, so you, all your, your block is on the GPU, it's on an SM, it's executing, and you, you do that load from global memory, from your vector, into, into shared memory, or whatever it is. Your, the first 16 threads say, give me this, give me this, uh, or the first eight, or whatever it is, say, give me this value. And then the next, and then the next, and then the next. And that's your one warp, right? Once those threads say, I, I want this value from memory, the system knows that they're not going to be doing anything anytime soon because that takes a long time. So it puts all the threads through that. They all make this request, and then the GPU kicks all the, the whole thread block off. And just, you're done, and loads the next thread block, thread block on, which could be at a totally different place in his program counter doing other things. Um, maybe it, it had already made those same requests, and now it, they're responding. So the next thread block is on. It's got a bunch of data back. And it does a bunch of math. And then that thread block makes some, some global memory requests. The GPU kicks that off, loads the other one back on, and now all of its data is ready, and it can continue. So the, the takeaway from this is, even though there's like a long time to get to global memory, it's really just a one-time latency cost if you have enough stuff to do. Because once you make that cost, you pay that one time, the pipeline is now full of things that are happening. And once one thing finishes, you still have new things to do. So um, it, it is a huge cost, but this makes up for it. A lot of the times, so though, you might, you, depending on your problem, you might not have enough red blocks. You might not have enough stuff to do. And, and with the latest cards, which have huge amounts of processors and huge amounts of resources, it's, it is difficult to fill them up. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. This is important um, when also with that, with the memory requests that aren't coalesced. So if you make one, one those, those unaligned, misaligned things, this takes longer because you're going to have 16 different or 32 different requests in the pipeline, so you're going to back stuff way up. Just another thing to keep in mind. Um, so the, the GPU scheduler handles all these sorts of things. When you go to memory, it knows, it decides, OK, you're, gonna, you're done, and it swaps you up, and the next person comes on, next thread block comes on. So that's why it's important to have multiple thread blocks ready to go, which means not too many registers, not too much shared memory, et cetera. Um, yeah, just said all that. So you pretty much always want to oversubscribe your thread. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you, you, these, it's when I first started doing this stuff, I was getting the worst performance, and it was because like I didn't have hundreds of thousands of threads. You know, I had ten or twenty, and, and that's just you really need tons and tons of work for these things to do. Because once once they stall and they block on memory or, or whatever in the pipeline, um, there's, they just get swapped out, hardware, new stuff happens, and you just you need that to be able to have new stuff to keep the pipeline full. So does anyone have any questions on the memory stuff? Because it's, it's kind of complicated. It's, it's also kind of the bottleneck of it, like, too. So, um, All right. All right.